So today I'm very glad to present Misha uh, Stefanov. He is a full professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He got his master's degree from Moscow State University in Russia. Well, uh, at that time it's actually Soviet Union, strictly speaking. He got his PhD in 1994 from the University of Oxford. Then he had several postdoc positions at the University of Illinois and then at uh, State University, uh, uh, Sunny, uh, Stony Brook State University uh, in New York. Uh, he uh, got a faculty position at the University of Illinois since 1999. At the same time, he was a Rick Fellow at Rick and BNL uh, Research Center for the first five years. He was an outstanding junior investigator uh, from the Department of Energy and Alfred uh, Sloan Fellow, 2002-2004. Uh, he uh, is well known for a lot of different work in this theory of strong interactions with a lot of applications to heavy end collisions, but not only. He is an author of a nice monograph from the Cambridge University Press that was published in 2003, together with uh, John Cogat on phases of quantum chromodynamics from confinement to extreme environments. He uh, received the University Scholar Award last year at the University of Illinois, as, uh, which is given for uh, faculty members uh, for superior research and teaching. And I'm very glad that he agreed to give a presentation today. And this is the topic that he is an expert on. So uh, challenge of discovering QCD critical point. Misha, you may start. Uh, thank you, Igor, for um, introduction. And uh, thank you for organizing this um, um, interesting series of uh, colloquia which is uh, even more important in these trying times to keep our community together. And I'm very happy to contribute. I will talk about um, the physics of the QCD critical point and uh, the current research, which is done uh, mostly theoretical uh, research that I will cover aimed at uh, uh, its uh, discovery. So this is the brief um, uh, outline of my talk. I will begin with a little bit of history since it's a colloquium. Um, I will uh, talk about critical point in general and QCD in particular and uh, about heavy ion collisions. And then I focus on the um, critical uh, ingredients of our understanding of uh, the QCD critical point and its manifestations and signatures in experiments. Uh, and I will break this talk, this part, into two parts where I will discuss equilibrium uh, physics and uh, then uh, turn to non equilibrium physics, which is uh, largely a work in progress. And I will describe the current state and, uh, uh, um, and the challenges. So, history. Um, so, if you go back, uh, the earliest um, um, observation or discovery of the critical point uh, could be claimed by uh, French physicist and engineer, Baron Cagnard de la Tour, who in 1822 asked the following question. So it was understood uh, then um, that uh, the uh, transition between liquid and uh, um, uh, gaseous phases of um, um, fluids can uh, occur. Uh, and he asked the following question. Suppose that we take a closed uh, container and fill it uh, with a little bit of uh, liquid. It will, at let's say room temperature, will reach some equilibrium with its uh, vapor. And then he asked what happens if uh, one heats it? Well, obviously the liquid just uh, evaporates. Um, uh, and the menisk will um, uh, go down. However, if I fill the uh, uh, more than half of the container with the uh, fluid, uh, 
then when I heat it, it will expand, consuming the space uh, occupied by the gas, so the manuscript will go out. Somewhere in between, there has to be a situation where uh, this um, uh, two behaviors should uh, switch from one to another. And he asked what happens then. Um, well, um, the interesting um, 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 technical solution which he found uh, to the following problem. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, this, uh, in order to, uh, to see something happening, uh, one has to reach uh, very high temperatures and, uh, you know, the uh, glass containers uh, were not really suitable uh, for some of his experiments. So he uh, used um, um, uh, gun barrels. Um, but the problem which arises is that gun barrel is not transparent. So how do you see what happens? So he decided, just think about it, um, he decided to uh, use a cannonball, which is sealed inside this gun barrel, and roll it by tilting uh, the barrel um, uh, back and forth, and listen to what happens. Uh, there was a splash when the uh, ball would cross the boundary. So what he discovered that this splash disappeared uh, at certain temperature. So in other words, um, uh, there was something um, happening here in which uh, uh, it wasn't that the fluid was filling the whole container of the gas, but rather the difference between the gas and the fluid disappeared. Um, he performed this experiment on a variety of different uh, uh, liquids and uh, found a similar um, uh, observation, including the ones in glass containers as well. Um, uh, this uh, discovery lay somewhat dormant for a couple of decades um, and um, uh, Faraday took interest in it because he was looking at the problem of liquefying ga gases at that time and uh, he found this uh, um, discovery of uh, De La Tour quite uh, uh, interesting um, to the extent that he wanted to come up with a name for the phenomenon that uh, he discovered because uh, De La Tour didn't give it one. And we know this because he wrote to his, uh, Faraday wrote to his friend um, uh, describing his attempts to, to name it. He suggested a few um, um, proposals which were shot down by his friend and um, uh, eventually he didn't come up with, uh, with the name which we use today. Um, Mendeleev, uh, who we know uh, from the periodic table, um, uh, also studied the vanishing of liquid vapor um, uh, interface by measuring surface tension and discovered, well, and uh, named the phenomenon absolute boiling temperature because it's the high temperature at which the liquid can boil. And the name we use today was eventually uh, given by a Scottish physicist, uh, Andrews, who uh, performed the uh, um, uh, quite extensive um, systematic uh, series of studies of different substances um, uh, um, uh, possessing a critical point. Uh, on the theoretical side, uh, we also um, um, can uh, uh, credit uh, Van der Waals, who uh, being a student um, uh, got interested into the a problem of describing equation of state of, uh, 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 of, of a liquid uh, with a critical point. And that's what we know today is uh, uh, Van der Waals equation of state. Um, the phenomenon of critical opalescence, which uh, rises in liquids uh, 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 near the critical point, uh, which is basically associated with the disappearance of the manuscript or the boundary separating the liquid and uh, uh, gas, uh, was uh, understood by Smolopovsky and Einstein. Um, Landau developed classical theory of critical phenomena in order to describe the critical point. Uh, and uh, finally, in order to achieve a, a agreement with experiment, uh, the uh, uh, fluctuation theory of the um, 
critical point was developed, uh, which uh, led essentially to the development of the powerful uh, realization group uh, formalism. I mentioned critical opalescence. This is how it looks like uh, in uh, modern experiment uh, when one shines a, a collimated uh, laser uh, beam at the um, container with a fluid. Um, uh, and one can see that uh, at a critical point, the uh, fluid becomes opalescent, scattering the light. Critical point is a very ubiquitous phenomenon. Uh, this is just a table uh, lifted from uh, Wikipedia with a far from complete list of substances and uh, their critical uh, parameters, temperature and pressure. Uh, this is the phase diagram of water, which you might have seen too, uh, which you can see this red point is a critical point, um, uh, which ends the first of the phase transition, uh, which we know is the boiling transition between liquid and, uh, uh, and its vapor. Uh, there is no transition beyond uh, that point at high temperatures uh, um, and uh, pressures. So it is a reasonable question to ask, um, is there a critical point in the matter described by quantum chromodynamics? Well, first of all, for the students, let me just uh, spend one transparency uh, uh, describing what uh, hydrodynamics uh, is and what it does. Um, for, uh, quantum chromodynamics, still, I said hydrodynamics, I was uh, running ahead. Uh, quantum chromodynamics um, tells us that fundamental constituents of uh, 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 matter uh, are quarks and gluons. Uh, and they are almost massless. However, the hadrons, which uh, you could think from the, uh, in the terminology of condensed matter uh, physics, are quasi-particles of QCD. These are the particles which we actually observe, uh, are massive. And the mass of, uh, of hadrons, uh, such as a proton, is essentially the energy of the QCD interaction. Uh, this is essentially the origin of uh, almost all of the visible mass in the universe. The um, uh, charges or colors uh, which uh, the constituents of QCD carry and the forces uh, which uh, this uh, uh, charges uh, uh, experience uh, are essentially hidden or confined within the hydrants. And high energy collisions uh, expose those uh, degrees of freedom and uh, high temperature environment uh, liberates those uh, um, charges and uh, forces. The resulting uh, uh, medium, uh, which is uh, created uh, uh, in the high temperature environment, um, is what we call quark gluon plasma. So um, we understand that at low temperature, quantum chromodynamics describes a gas of um, hadrons, quasi-particles of uh, QCD. At high temperature, it describes a gas of almost massless quarks and gluons. So is there a transition between them and is there a critical point? Well, uh, uh, the first question we need to ask is, can those two phases continuously transform into each other? The, the essential uh, ingredient of the critical point phenomena is that it's a point which separates the region of the phase diagram um, where on one side uh, the region where the uh, liquid can boil and uh, coexist uh, with its uh, uh, vapor and another where there is no difference between them. So can those two phases be um, connected without a transition? The answer is yes. So this is how the phase diagram of QCD looks like, and that's the, the way that it's uh, conventionally um, uh, described um, and, uh, and um, uh, calculated in um, models or lattice calculations. So the lattice QCD tells us that um, at zero chemical potential uh, for baryon number, uh, so this horizontal axis is the um, 
is the uh, chemical potential which controls the net pairing asymmetry of matter. Uh, at zero, the, uh, uh, the density of baryons and antibaryons uh, exactly uh, balance each other. So at that uh, value of the chemical potential, increasing the temperature, um, it is possible to calculate the pressure and all other thermodynamic quantities in QCD uh, numerically um, uh, uh, with controllable precision uh, on the lattice, on the space-time lattice. And uh, the conclusion of these studies is that there is no phase transition. Uh, there is, however, a uh, rather um, uh, significant change in the properties of the quark gluon plasma. The pressure rises significantly from the smaller value, which it has in the um, hadron gas, uh, to a larger value, which it has in the quark gluon plasma. So we know that this transition is associated with, uh, 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 with the uh, change of the um, phase of QCD from hadron gas uh, to quark gluon plasma. However, this transition is not uh, sharp. In other words, there is no point at which those two coexist. Rather, the uh, one phase continuously uh, transforms into the other. The second question we need to ask is, is there um, another region, the region uh, on the phase diagram where there is a phase coexistence or a first order phase transition? So can uh, the, uh, uh, the liquid boil? And the answer to this question is not so um, definite as uh, the answer to the first question, uh, but it is likely. So I deliberately shaded this region where uh, the most interesting um, uh, phenomena occur in the phase diagram of QCD, including the phase transition, because the knowledge of this part of the phase diagram is um, um, not as reliable as uh, that um, of the uh, zero small chemical potential region where the information comes from the lattice. Um, however, uh, from what we can infer from uh, models, uh, the critical point is ubiquitous phenomenon in uh, a variety of uh, very different uh, approaches uh, describing the phase diagram uh, of uh, QCD. So it's a reasonable to ask a question, is there a critical point in QCD? So how do we answer this question? How can one discover the QCD critical point? Well, one can outline essentially two approaches. Uh, one, one might say this theoretical, and another one experimental. Uh, I will talk mostly about uh, the physics related to the second approach, but I will mention that uh, there is a significant effort is also being put uh, in uh, extending lattice simulation, overcoming the sign problem in order to um, answer that question. One needs to be able to do numerical calculation at non-zero chemical potential in order to determine whether and where uh, the critical point is on the uh, phase diagram. Right now, the best we can do is uh, uh, use um, uh, extrapolation uh, using, for example, uh, calculating coefficients of the Taylor expansion at n equals zero and using certain uh, uh, assumptions uh, for analyticity and convergence, one might um, put some bounds uh, on where the critical point uh, is uh, located. I will not talk much about it. Um, I will uh, discuss the, uh, the second approach, uh, which uh, is uh, based on uh, attempting to find the signatures of the critical point and heavy ion collisions. And uh, this approach uh, has its own um, challenge. And that challenge is how to deal with the non-equilibrium um, dynamics. So let me, again, for the benefit of the students, uh, talk a little bit more about what uh, one would need to know about heavy ion collisions um, to understand the following. 
And the simple way to, or useful way to think about it is to compare heavy ion collisions with uh, uh, standard cosmology. Um, uh, it is common in our field to compare heavy ion collisions or um, um, the explosion of the fireball, which uh, is created by a collision of two nuclear pancakes, like in this figure, uh, to compare it with the uh, explosion which created our world, our universe. Um, similarly, in both cases, the, uh, the process which occurs is the expansion and cooling of the, uh, of the medium. Um, and an important difference, important for what follows, is that um, uh, we are dealing with only one event, uh, or at least we think so, um, in, the, in the case of uh, cosmology. Uh, while in heavy ion collisions, we can repeat it as many times as, uh, as we want. Uh, so what is uh, known as cosmic variance is a problem in, uh, um, in um, uh, cosmology because we cannot do statistics on one event. Uh, while uh, in the uh, heavy ion collisions, the event by event fluctuations is a whole field of studies. Uh, and it uses the uh, events, copious events, which are produced uh, in the heavy ion um, collisions. Um, another uh, uh, similarity uh, between the two uh, processes is uh, that this uh, expansion of the medium is accompanied by cooling uh, and is followed by a freeze out. The freeze out is a process in which the particles, uh, quasi particles, which uh, make this uh, expanding uh, medium or plasma uh, eventually um, uh, decouple. Their evolution is no longer affected by uh, collisions with, uh, with, with other particles and they free stream to the detector. Uh, so whatever state the system was uh, at that moment of the evolution is preserved or frozen out and uh, can be read off by a detector. Uh, that's what we do, for example, when we observe the cosmic microwave background uh, radiation. And that's what we do when we observe the particles uh, which are created in heavy ion collisions. Again, the difference is that while we cannot uh, tune the parameters of the, um, um, of the uh, Big Bang, we, do, we can tune the parameters of heavy ion collisions. In particular, uh, we can adjust the energy of the initial energy of the colliding nuclei, which translates uh, uh, in a large part into a change in the chemical potential. That is, we can scan the phase diagram as we reduce the um, energy of the collision. These are the red points indicate some of the uh, experimentally measured uh, temperatures and chemical potentials achieved at the freeze out at heavy ion collisions at different energies. Um, in other lines of the uh, uh, marks on this phase diagram, this, uh, uh, this, uh, these lines which uh, go towards this point um, is uh, what we understand theoretically and uh, um, um, in some part uh, through experimental evidence is a trajectory of the fireball or rather its thermodynamic state through out the evolution of the system, which terminates at the freeze out point. This trajectory begins at different points on the phase diagram, depending on uh, the initial energy of the collision, which is here indicated by numbers. Um, and uh, so changing the square root of the uh, square root of S, the energy of the colliding uh, uh, nu uh, um, nuclei, uh, one can scan the phase diagram, one can change the position of the freeze out point along this uh, sort of um, imagined curve uh, of the um, freeze out points. Uh, uh, for example, um, uh, what I uh, refer to later as Beam Energy Scan 2, which is an experimental program um, underway in, uh, at uh, uh, Rhesusic Heavy Ion Collision in Brookhaven. Um, uh, covers uh, or plans to cover this range of the um, uh, phase diagram. It corresponds to the energies of the collisions which uh, it can uh, produce. 
Um, now let me turn to uh, the signatures of the uh, critical point. And the, uh, again, uh, I will, as I already uh, said, I will describe uh, this in two um, uh, stages. So for the first stage, or for, the, for the next part of this talk, I will assume that the heavy ion collision creates matter uh, sufficiently close to equilibrium. And there is a good experimental evidence for that, that we can study thermodynamics at result. Um, uh, characterize the medium uh, or uh, QCD matter by temperature and uh, baryon chemical potential. And the experimental uh, observables I will be focusing on will be uh, related to uh, event by event fluctuation. And it is important to know the following um, that um, heavy ion collisions create systems which are not. Uh, too large, in a sense uh, of comparison with condensed matter system where the uh, typical number of particles are astronomically large, a Lagarde number, the typical number of particles in, um, uh, created uh, in the uh, explosion of the fireball in heavy ion collisions is uh, much uh, smaller. However, it's still large enough uh, that we can uh, uh, use statistical and thermodynamic concepts uh, to describe uh, this uh, matter. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to talk about phase diagram. Um, but so the importance of the fact that this number is not so large is that the fluctuations are not too small. As we know from textbook thermodynamics, the relative size of fluctuations is, is suppressed by central limit theorem uh, to be one of a square root of the number of uh, uh, degrees of freedom. And this is just an example of the uh, histogram of the distribution of the num net number of protons observed uh, over um, a sample of uh, uh, events. You can see that this number is not the same in all events and it uh, fluctuates with this typical uh, almost Gaussian uh, shape. So with that, I will turn to, um, uh, to the signatures of the critical point. As I already uh, suggested, uh, the signatures we are going to look at is the um, event by event fluctuations as a function or their uh, magnitude and uh, characteristics as a function of the collision energy as we scan the phase diagram. Um, so let me, uh, again, for the benefits of the student, um, give a brief um, uh, setup of how I would like to think about the thermodynamic fluctuations. I would like to follow the uh, picture which was introduced by Einstein um, when he uh, described the phenomenon of critical opalescence. He observed uh, something which uh, now we take as uh, um, self-evident that the probability distribution for uh, some uh, order parameter, which I will call sigma, is essentially exponential of the entropy. By order parameter, um, we should uh, 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 mean a quantity which um, uh, is um, uh, different in two phases. For example, the density. Uh, the, what distinguishes liquid from gas is its density. So this could be density or in a reduced context, it would be an energy density. Um, so in um, thermodynamically um, large system, a system with many degrees of freedom, the, um, this um, uh, uh, function or the probability distribution uh, is a, uh, has a peak. So in other words, uh, the uh, fluctuation of the order parameter uh, or the order parameter has some mean value, uh, which is the thermodynamic, what we call thermodynamic uh, value of the thermodynamic equilibrium, but in a finite system, uh, the different members of the ensemble, uh, or in our case, different uh, uh, events, uh, will, um, uh, will uh, have a different uh, value of this uh, order parameter. This fluctuation, however, in thermodynamic limit uh, become negligible because they, as I already said, suppressed by um, inverse square root of volume. Critical point is um, uh, singular in that uh, respect, in that uh, this, um, um, this argument breaks down. So in other words, 
uh, whilst uh, in general, uh, when we uh, send volume to zero, the fluctuation uh, magnitude, which is characterized by variance in this formula, uh, vanishes so that the product, uh, which uh, I will call chi, the susceptibility of the order parameter, um, uh, remains uh, finite, not at the critical point. Um, that on, on the surface uh, suggests that uh, the um, um, central limit theorem uh, is, is violated in, at the critical point. It's a central limit theorem which tells us that all uh, distribution uh, of, of large number of independent variables have to tend to Gaussian. Um, well, it's not this central limit theorem but it breaks down, but rather the assumption uh, that, uh, that the fluctuation of order parameter is a sum of large number of um, um, independent or uncorrelated uh, fluctuations. That is not true at the critical point. The um, correlations grow at the critical point. The size of the region uh, over which the fluctuations are no longer uncorrelated grows. Uh, that size is characterized by the uh, uh, correlation lengths. Um, and uh, the main uh, feature of the critical point, which allows uh, the uh, critical point, uh, which explains all of its phenomena, is the um, uh, growth and divergence of the um, uh, correlation lengths. So this is the picture, essentially, which explains in another way why the distribution cannot remain Gaussian at the critical point, because it has to undergo a transition from one uh, 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 peak corresponding to uh, one phase, essentially, to two peaks corresponding to two coexisting phases. And one phase dominates over the other, depending on, on which side of the uh, first of the phase transition you are. In between, the distribution has to somehow flatten. And that means that it cannot remain uh, Gaussian. The measures of non-Gaussianity has to increase as you approach the critical point. And they increase with the specific powers of uh, correlation lengths, which I am going to discuss in the next uh, transparency. Um, the, the specific measures of the non-Gaussianity are the higher moments of the, uh, the uh, non-Gaussian moments of the distribution or, or uh, more um, appropriately, they're called cumulants. Um, so for an example, the Gaussian cumulant or the lowest, uh, uh, the quadratic moment is the variance of the uh, fluctuating order parameter, the expectation value of sigma squared. Um, as we already discussed, it grows like uh, correlation length squared However, higher moments grow with higher powers of correlation lengths. For example, the uh, fourth moment uh, uh, or cumulant of, of the uh, distribution uh, grows with the power of the correlation lengths equals to seven. It's significantly more sensitive to the, um, uh, to the uh, proximity of the critical point or to the value of the correlation lengths. And that makes it potentially uh, a very useful signature for the critical point. Um, furthermore, uh, while the uh, variance or quadratic cumulant uh, uh, must be always positive, the sign of the high order cumulant uh, is not constrained in this way. And moreover, the sign depends on which side of the critical point uh, we are. And what is important is that all these properties are universal. We do not know, we do not need to know microscopic details uh, of, of the theory. We don't even know where the critical point is or how strong the singularity is to, to say uh, what, for example, the power of the correlation lengths will control the growth of, uh, of humans. These quantities are universal. Um, and uh, uh, that universality, of course, uh, um, is um, valid within a certain class of uh, theories, which are called universality classes. And the representative member of this class for the uh, liquid gas uh, critical point or QCD uh, critical point is uh, Ising model. And in Ising model, we know that there are two directions 
uh, which can uh, control the approach to criticality or deviation from criticality. One is the temperature like, uh, which is denoted here by T. This is reduced temperature, the difference from critical temperature or Curie temperature. And another one is the ordering field or magnetic field if it's a magnet. Uh, and one can see uh, that uh, for lower temperature, we have a coexistence. So first to a phase transition at higher temperature, changing magnetic field allows us to go from a phase with positive magnetization to negative magnetization without any discontinuity. That's the cross off. And uh, one can see that depending on the, um, from this picture that depending on uh, where we are on this two dimensional phase diagram, uh, the sign of the quartic cumulant kappa four uh, is uh, different. Uh, red is negative, blue is positive. Uh, as I said, uh, universality means that a similar uh, pattern should uh, occur in the vicinity of every critical point, including the critical point of QCD. And that's what uh, one, um, uh, uh, what we understand we should expect. Um, there is, of course, a mapping between the parameters of the Ising model, T and H, uh, and the parameters uh, which controlling approach to the critical point in, uh, on the phase diagram of QCD, which in this case will be the baryon chemical potential, mu D, and temperature. And of course, this mapping is not uh, simply orthogonal. The only thing we know about it, which is universal, is that the temperature direction is aligned with the first of the phase transition. Uh, we also know that the angle here for small quark masses actually becomes uh, smaller. Um, that's, that is also universal. Um, finally, uh, in order to map uh, this uh, universal uh, properties to QCD, we also need to uh, realize that um, heavy ion collisions do not directly measure the fluctuations of order parameter. Uh, they measure the fluctuations as in this uh, plot um, of the number of uh, produced uh, particles or multiplicities. Um, one can establish the relationship between two and show that uh, the fluctuations of the order parameter essentially translates into the fluctuations of multiplicity. Indeed, uh, fluctuation of the density naturally produces uh, a fluctuation in the uh, number of uh, proton produced, for example. And that's the measurements which experiments uh, can do. Um, and what should they expect? Um, well, if we superimpose uh, on, onto the previous plot of the, um, which describes the uh, behavior of the uh, uh, quartic cumulant uh, with a freeze out line, this is what, uh, how it would look like. Uh, which would translate into the following dependence of uh, this measure of the uh, quartic cumulant, uh, which I call here omega-4, is just normalized, um, as a function of square root of s. As, I, as one decreases the energy of the collisions, or square root of s, the chemical potential increases, and we move along this line uh, to large mu b and down, passing the critical point, and one can see this very uh, characteristic uh, dependence. And um, it is somewhat encouraging that experiments actually see a behavior similar to this. Of course, uh, it is no more than intriguing hint, but it's the intriguing hint which uh, uh, motivates um, uh, uh, a closer look, which is essentially what the uh, beam energy scan phase two um, uh, is uh, about. Uh, its purpose is to understand better the uh, dependence on this and other uh, measures which I didn't talk about, uh, which uh, behave uh, similarly uh, intriguing uh, behavior. For example, for the quartic cumulant um, uh, or this uh, combination of quartic cumulant with, uh, with other quantities, one can see uh, that the beam energy scan will reduce the error bars, which here is is, uh, is, is too large yet to make any definite conclusion to these values, uh, which will make possible to make a better um, um, judgment. Finally, this brings me to my uh, last uh, part of, of the talk, uh, non-equilibrium, uh, the importance of non-equilibrium physics. And this is the work in progress. It is important to know that non-equilibrium physics is essential uh, near the critical point. Uh, and uh, um, it is 
much more um, uh, difficult and rich, uh, rich uh, subject uh, than equilibrium physics. And it's a challenge, especially in an environment such as complex as uh, heavy ion collisions. And it's a challenge which is taken by beam energy scan theory uh, collaboration, whose work I will partly describe uh, in this part of the talk. The goal here is to develop a quantitative theoretical framework, which would allow us to uh, predict and uh, describe um, uh, the critical point signatures uh, and compare them with experiments. Uh, the strategy is uh, to develop a parameterization of equation of state, since we don't know where the critical point is and what the, uh, some non-universal parameters are, such as, for example, the slopes of these lines of uh, mapping um, the phase diagram of Ising model. Uh, this parameterization has, uh, um, 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 has already received a significant effort and there are uh, existing um, um, uh, the, existing um, uh, the existing equations of states which uh, could be used already in uh, hydrodynamic simulations. So what I will describe is um, uh, how to um, describe the evolution of fluctuations in hydrodynamics. Because uh, as it is, should be clear from the previous part of the talk, we would want to compare the theoretical prediction for the magnitude and the shape of the um, uh, fluctuations to experiment. Um, so what is the tool which we need to use? Um, well, the tool to describe fluctuations um, in, the, um, uh, in the dynamic environment uh, is uh, stochastic hydrodynamics. Let me uh, again uh, lay uh, down some basic, um, uh, basics uh, uh, of this approach. Uh, first of all, um, hydrodynamics itself um, uh, is, well, should be thought of as an effective theory um, and uh, it is essentially effective theory for the slow degrees of freedom. The slow degrees of freedom in, uh, any, sim uh, in, in any hydrodynamic systems are essentially the conserved densities. For example, the density of the, the energy density or the uh, momentum density. These quantities are conserved uh, and therefore uh, their densities uh, evolve slowly and their Bayes conservation relation. Each of these equations, uh, for example, this equation it describes four equations simultaneously, uh, can be written in this uh, kind of general form that the time rate of uh, change of uh, density is basically equal to the uh, negative of the flux of this uh, quantity uh, out of the um, uh, volume. Um, Stochastic hydrodynamics recognizes that uh, the quantities uh, which, uh, uh, which we are talking about in this um, uh, first equation are essentially averages. Um, and they fluctuate around uh, the equilibrium as uh, we already talked about. In order to describe this, uh, we want to, um, to, break the, um, um, uh, to break the space into, into cells or the liquid into, uh, into cells of the size which are large enough in order to, for these fluctuations to be small, but not large enough so that uh, the change in the, uh, so that the liquid can be still considered homogeneous. So it has to be uh, uh, within that cell. Uh, so it has to be much smaller than the uh, uh, typical scale of the gradients, which I denote by capital L. Um, and uh, in this case, the variables which are obtained by this congruent will fluctuate. And therefore, while well, they still will be conserved, however, the relate, what, what becomes uh, stochastic is the relationship between the flux of this quantity and the, um, uh, between, and the quantity itself there is additional uh, uh, noise in this relationship. And that's essentially produces the um, um, equilibrium uh, um, distribution of fluctuations. This approach is uh, uh, essentially due to, is a textbook approach due to Landau and Lifshitz. It has been generalized to, um, uh, to uh, relativistic um, 
hydrodynamics and uh, studied in uh, in the context of heavy ion collision and uh, expanding firewalls uh, already. Um, I should point out that uh, one of the uh, uh, problems or uh, challenges in this approach is to generalizing this essentially linear equation. Usually it's described in linearized approximation to uh, full nonlinear hydrodynamics. Hydrodynamics is nonlinear. Um, this produces ultraviolet divergences, which are similar to divergences in the quantum field theory and can be dealt in a similar way. However, in numerical simulations, uh, they introduce uh, the dependence on the cutoff or, the, or specifically on the size of this uh, hydrodynamic cell B. So um, another approach, uh, which is uh, uh, from that point of view is, uh, uh, is advantageous, is uh, what can be called a deterministic approach. In this case, the quantities which we're dealing with are not stochastic, they're deterministic, but they describe the stochastic uh, properties of stochastic quantities, such as their mean, which I will denote by psi, and uh, their fluctuations, or higher moments, uh, if need be. Um, um, as a result, the, um, the equations, uh, the relationship between flux and the mean is now again modified it depends the flux now depends not only on the mean value of the quantity but also on its fluctuation or the moment uh, uh, or the quantity which describes it such as uh, for example the uh, equal time correlator which are denoted by g this introduces additional variable for which we also need to write a relaxation uh, equation there are a um, couple of ways to uh, uh, write these additional equations and I will describe both of them and uh, uh, it is very satisfying to see that they uh, give the same uh, answer. They are very different. Um, so the advantage of this approach is uh, that the resulting equations are not stochastic or deterministic and uh, perhaps even more important is that uh, the uh, infinite noise problem, the problem which is due to the fact that nonlinearity, well, the, um, uh, the noise in each cell has to become uh, larger and larger as the cell size decreases in order for the average over many cells to become to be the same. So that problem of very large noise uh, causes, um, uh, causes difficulties in numerical uh, simulations. And it's essentially uh, similar to ultraviolet uh, divergences in quantum field theory can be dealt in the same way analytically it turns out in 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 this deterministic approach um, so let me describe uh, one way of arriving at these um, uh, equations of relaxation for the uh, uh, fluctuation correlator which is essentially underlines the approach which we uh, call hydro plus it's essentially reference to the fact that we extend hydrodynamics by adding uh, additional uh, non-hydrodynamic modes, which are essential for, uh, for its evolution um, further away from equilibrium. Um, so uh, in particular, this approach is important near the critical point because the fluctuations are enhanced and essentially define uh, the physics at the critical point. So there are two ingredients which are necessary. One is the critical fluctuations, uh, that is the fluctuations whose correlation lengths uh, diverges. And another um, which, uh, uh, which, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, which this description has to take uh, uh, care of is the uh, slow relaxation mode. This is uh, uh, the, uh, the phenomenon of the critical slowing down. The, um, uh, the, equilibrium at the critical point takes longer time to achieve and that relaxation time again uh, grows with the power of the correlation lengths uh, which is also universal in particular because the bulk viscosity is uh, proportional to this relaxation time bulk viscosity diverges and that essentially leads to breakdown of hydrodynamics uh, at the critical point eventually it turns out that both uh, these ingredients, critical fluctuation and their slow relaxation are described by the same object, which is a two-point function. 
uh, similar to G. In this case, the fluctuation variable is the slowest hydrodynamic mode, uh, which is the ratio of the entropy to, um, uh, to the baryon uh, number densities, S over N, where I will call it M. Um, as I already said, if we don't include this mode, the hydrodynamics will break down at the critical point. So the purpose of including this mode among uh, others is uh, uh, to extend the validity of hydrodynamics. Um, in order to describe this, uh, uh, um, uh, we need uh, uh, to define the variables. Uh, well, in this case, it's a two point function. So it's a function of two uh, vector variables in addition to a function of time. Uh, and uh, it's um, convenient to use an equal time correlator. And it is further convenient to do a, a Fourier transform with respect to the distance between this point or vector separating these two points, which I call delta x. Essentially, it's a Wigner transform. It is uh, commonly used uh, in deriving kinetic theory and in many respects, uh, this quantity which I call phi q uh, is similar to the particle distribution function in the kinetic theory, uh, mathematically. Um, uh, and the reason uh, for this uh, separation uh, into the dependence on the mean or the medial, middle point and the separation uh, is because the um, dependence on uh, these two variables, x and delta x, is, uh, um, occurs at different scales. The dependence on uh, middle point is essentially uh, 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 described by the uh, scale of the gradients, hydrodynamic gradients or inhomogeneities of the system, which I call L, while the dependence on the separation is much shorter. Um, so now turning to the question, how do we derive the, or obtain the equation for the evolution of this quantity? And one way to think about it is to remember that the evolution is essentially um, uh, as usual in um, um, hydrodynamics is, is, is a, it's an approach to equilibration and equilibration means maximizing entropy. So, uh, one approach is to write down the entropy of the system for a given value of this variable phi q. So uh, it's possible to do, and uh, I will of course skip the derivation, but I will try to describe the origin of this additional contribution. So uh, entropy of course is, uh, um, is uh, given in, in complete thermal equilibrium uh, as a function of uh, energy density and um, <clears throat> charge density, or in this case, in our case, is baryon density N. However, um, uh, phi Q, or the uh, measure of the fluctuation, describe the de deviation from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, could describe deviation from equilibrium. And equilibrium, of course, phi Q is equal to some equilibrium value, which is given by Einstein formula and I called it phi q bar. Uh, away from equilibrium, however, uh, the entropy is smaller and it's smaller by this contribution, which is um, uh, written here, which uh, you can check is always uh, negative, except at the point where phi q is equal to equilibrium value, phi q bar, in which case it vanishes and the entropy becomes, uh, reaches its maximal value. It's easy to understand each in term in this formula. So basically there are two terms which contain this dependence. The first one simply tells us or reflects the fact that the entropy is the number of states and phi q is the width of the distribution over, uh, so it characterizes how many states there are. So since the entropy is a log of this, it's natural to find uh, uh, that there is a, a, a log of the square root of phi, which is the width of the distribution in this formula with a positive sign. And there is additional contribution which balances it um, uh, because the uh, maximum of entropy is achieved at phi, um, uh, um, uh, at, um, um, at, 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 at uh, sorry, the maximum of entropy is achieved at the mean value of the fluctuating variable. And the larger the fluctuations, the more uh, 
uh, members of the ensemble are away from that mean uh, and therefore uh, uh, penalized by a large entropy. That's the second time. And they balance each other leading to uh, a complete consolation when phi is equal to phi bar. Um, following this logic, then we could uh, uh, write the equation of the evolution of IQ in the Onsaga form, which is basically uh, saying that the local, uh, the time rate evolution in the local rest frame of the fluid of this quantity is basically proportional to the uh, thermodynamic force, which is the uh, uh, gradient of entropy with respect to this quantity. The coefficient here uh, is, is is known because um, uh, uh, it can be calculated in what is known as model H. Um, and uh, well, the only thing we probably needs to know about it is that obviously it vanishes when Q equals to zero simply because the quant fluctuating quantity which uh, uh, this fluctuation measure um, um, uh, uh, refers to is conserved. So it's essentially diffusion. D is a diffusion coefficient. Uh, it vanishes at the critical point and therefore the characteristic rate also vanishes um, at a characteristic scale, which is a correlation length with the power psi to the minus three, which we already discussed. So the second uh, approach, which is uh, more general, is to um, um, is to extend this to all thermodynamic variables, fluctuation of all uh, hydrodynamic variables, which are convenient to take to be in addition to M, uh, the entropy per baryon as pressure and flow velocity, and I will denote them generically by phi. And there are two um, important issues which one needs to address before one can derive this equation. One is what do we actually mean by equal time uh, correlation function? What do we mean by equal time in the relativistic hydra where the equality of time is not absolute uh, and how does one do normalization? I will go just very briefly through this. So to define the equal time, obviously we need to, um, uh, uh, to choose a frame. Well, the natural choice of the frame, of course, uh, is a local rest frame of the fluid, but it's different in different uh, uh, points in the fluid and you can see um, um, well, here I will I just denote the Lorentz uh, boost by just uh, Euclidean rotation. That's an easier. That what is called equal time at one point, uh, the same separation vector is no longer uh, corresponds to equal time. So one needs to rotate this vector. That's one ingredient one needs to add. Um, one also um, uh, turns out it's useful also to. Um, rotate all the quantities which uh, are frame dependent, such as, for example, fluctuation of flow velocity, phi has such a component in it, um, to the same frame before one does this subtraction in order to define the derivative. So such derivative, um, uh, we, um, we, we term confluent derivative because it's uh, related to or adjusted for the flow. Uh, altogether, eventually, uh, one could uh, generalize the concept of derivative uh, to the object which essentially takes all this into account and is very similar to covariant derivative in the sense that it uh, uh, contains um, uh, connection terms. Uh, if you are familiar uh, with covariant derivative, you immediately recognize them. Uh, so these two connection terms have to do with the fact that uh, we uh, adjust the, um, uh, the variables before we um, put them into a correlator and compare it to different points. And this has to do with uh, the fact that we, uh, this uh, which I described on the previous transparency is that we need to maintain the, um, uh, the equal uh, time hypersurface uh, at, at different at each uh, point in space. And then we can define the Wigner transform, which we call W. All in all, um, after a lots of algebra, which I should credit significantly to the work of uh, Shin An, my student, um, one arrives at remarkably simple uh, uh, equations. For example, for the longitudinal uh, fluctuations, uh, the fluctuations of pressure and the velocity along the uh, wave uh, uh, vector, 
at constant uh, s over n, these are essentially sound uh, fluctuations. Um, the equation is essentially could be viewed as an equation for a propagate uh, as a kinetic equation for phonons propagating on a uh, inhomogeneous background. The background is inhomogeneous because uh, the density changes, so the velocity of the phonon is different at different points in space. So the uh, its uh, dispersion relation depends not only on its momentum but also on where it is, and its velocity as well. Um, and uh, it's subject to inertial forces because the uh, fluid uh, moves. So it's subject to forces proportional to acceleration of the fluid, vorticity of the fluid, and the expansion rate of the fluid, which we, uh, which we um, uh, dubbed inertial Coriolis and Hubble forces uh, in this, uh, in this uh, formula. And uh, this term is essentially a relaxation term. It tells us that, um, uh, that in equilibrium, the, uh, the density has to reach this uh, uh, value or rather function of Q, which turns out to be the equilibrium Bose distribution, which is what you would expect from such uh, particles as phonons. Uh, well, there are more modes. Uh, and uh, of course, they, uh, they, uh, uh, the equations uh, uh, split, uh, except there is a sector uh, where uh, uh, correlations of fluctuations of entropy and the uh, velocity transverse to the uh, uh, vector of the uh, uh, wave vector, um, they actually mix. And these mixing equations, I only wrote the relaxation times in, uh, uh, terms in these equations, uh, look like this. Um, one can see again that the left-hand side is essentially the same uh, Liouville operator, except with uh, uh, for quote unquote particles with zero velocity because it's a diffusive process. There's no propagation and no inertial forces for the same reason. And uh, uh, the relaxation is essentially diffusion. Uh, one can see that the uh, fluctuations relax. For example, the fluctuations of the S over N relax to its equilibrium value, which is C P over N. Uh, the fluctuations of the mixed uh, correlator between the entropy per baryon and velocity relax to zero. There is no equilibrium term here. Uh, and the fluctuation of, of correlations of velocity relax to also to its equilibrium for value that should be delta ij obviously here. Uh, the smallest relaxation rate is the relaxation rate associated with the um, uh, diffusion, uh, uh, which is uh, gamma lambda. Um, and it, uh, uh, vanishes um, so at very uh, late times if you wish uh, the the equation for the slowest mode which is um, fluctuation of the entropy per variant density decouples and what we get is exactly the equation uh, of hydro plus which we derived uh, for phi q which is related to this correlation function and this relationship is very very non-trivial Um, so what does this additional um, um, equations give us or additional degrees of freedom? Well, they allow us similar uh, to hydro plus uh, by adding just the, uh, the correlation function of the entropy variant down, but allows us to extend the range of applicability of hydrodynamics to, um, uh, to, to larger frequencies, uh, which are uh, xi to the minus two, now we can extend it even further uh, to xi minus one. And the breakdown of uh, hydrodynamics in each regime is basically characterized by the uh, non-negligible or significant frequency dependence of the kinetic coefficient. Kinetic coefficients have to be constant in hydrodynamics. And the dependence of bulk viscosity on frequency is a manifestation of its breakdown. Um, I don't think I have time to discuss randomization issues. I will just say that uh, uh, it is a conceptual uh, as well as a practical issue because it allows us to write equations in terms of very normalized quantities um, uh, such that the results of simulations do not depend on, um, on the cutoff or the hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic cell size. 
So um, I'm coming to my uh, conclusion. The, um, uh, the outstanding issues uh, in, this, in, in, in this research are obviously extending uh, this analysis to high order correlators, which is what we are working on. Um, uh, it is also important to connect to experiment to be able to um, implement freeze out um, uh, of this hydro in order to uh, translate the fluctuations of, let's say, densities in the fluctuation of multiplicities. Uh, the other interesting question, uh, both conceptually and uh, for comparison with experiment, is um, what happens at the first order phase transition? Uh, and there are also interesting theoretical questions related to connection, obvious uh, uh, connections of this um, approach to the action principle based on schwinger keldish formulation of hydrodynamics, which has been developed recently by several groups. This brings me to my summary. The fundamental question uh, which uh, I um, um, discussed in this talk is uh, where, uh, where is the critical point on the um, uh, phase boundary between uh, quark gluon plasma and the hydrogen gas phases of QCD. Um, as we have seen, there are intriguing uh, hints uh, in the experiments um, performed at uh, RIC, and there are more uh, to come again from RIC as well as from other planned uh, uh, experiments um, in, uh, around the world. The, quant of the, uh, the quantitative theoretical framework uh, is being developed by um, uh, the best collaboration. And um, what I describe is um, the effort on uh, uh, describing uh, the uh, non-equilibrium effects, which are important to determine the magnitude uh, uh, of fluctuation signatures uh, uh, in heavy ion collisions, where non-equilibrium effects are very important. Uh, in turn, critical fluctuations uh, feedback into hydrodynamics. And uh, in particular, this is the feedback which can be captured by a series which includes uh, uh, additional non-hydrodynamic modes such as hydroplasm. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I definitely learned something new. Uh, any questions from the audience? I do see Pavel, uh, so go ahead, do ask the question. Um, hi, Misha, thank you for the talk. Um, so my question is um, about the divergence of uh, transport coefficients in uh, this uh, deterministic theory, divergence of viscosity, whatnot, at the critical point. So is it, is it something that is put in by hand or is it something that comes out of the formalism? Um, in hydroplasts, uh, it comes out, out of formalism. So in hydrodynamics, the divergence, of course, have to, come in, have to be put by hand. Because in hydrodynamics, uh, bulk viscosity is essentially a, uh, a coefficient, which uh, comes from, um, from um, let's say, Kubo formula, right? It uh, does not depend on frequency. Um, in hydrodynamics, uh, if you think of hydrodynamics as expansion in a traditional way, as expansion in gradients, uh, this is a coefficient of that expansion, right? Uh, in uh, hydroplus, um, there is, uh, of course, um, uh, this contribution uh, to, I don't think I have an equation here. So I could point uh, uh, point to it. So uh, sorry, I will have to say it in words. Um, in hydroplus, uh, this dependence comes um, because uh, um, because the system uh, has to relax to equilibrium, uh, and uh, the deviation from equilibrium is characterized by the uh, deviation from equilibrium of the value of uh, some additional variable. So the rate by which this additional variable relaxes to equilibrium determines two different regimes uh, uh, in terms of frequency. 
if the system evolves slower than the uh, rate of the relaxation of this additional variable, then um, the uh, hydrodynamics applies, but with large bulk viscosity. Bulk viscosity is proportional to the rate of relaxation of that uh, additional slowest hydrodynamic mode, non-hydrodynamic mode. Uh, however, if the evolution of the system is faster uh, than the um, uh, rate of relax uh, the uh, rate of relaxation of this additional mode, then this additional mode doesn't have time to relax. So, effectively, changes equation of becomes stiffer, right? Um, and um, so it's a different, uh, it, 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 it's a different system. Right? Well, well, so I, I sort of if you it. now use, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I was just wondering about the precise place in the equation where the feedback of that extra mode um, uh, happens on, on the transport coefficients. Let me see. Um, Uh, I'm just looking for an equation which I can point to. Mm -hmm. I think um, in the language which you introduced um, is it is in the long time tails. So let me try to find the picture here. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so in Hydro Plus, the way uh, the way this appears is that. Um, um, is that the, equa the equations are written uh, uh, using the pressure, which is a function not only of energy density, charge density, but also of phi q, right? So mm -hmm. phi q is no longer um, um, if just given as a function of epsilon n. It has its own dynamics, mm -hmm. which is a relaxation dynamics, right? So if phi q is an equilibrium, then this pressure is the same as an equilibrium pressure. But if it isn't, then uh, this is where the feedback of the evolution of the um, uh, phi q enters into the uh, hydrodynamic equation, which describes the evolution of energy and charge density, right? And that feedback could be described as an addition or frequency dependent addition to the bulk viscosity. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Another way to think about it is uh, to think that there is a contribution to, um, to hydrodynamic equations, which is due to uh, what you call long time tails and what we call long time tails, which is essentially the uh, two point correlation function contribution to the uh, uh, average value of T mu nu. Remember, T mu nu fluctuate and it's nonlinear function of the variables. Mm -hmm. So when you expand it, uh, uh, the linear terms can cancel, but there is a quadratic term which uh, whose average is um, proportional to this uh, two point uh, function, uh, right? And that two point function is that additional variable and, it, um, and that phi q in hydro plus, uh, but in the general formalism, uh, there are other modes as well. A phi q is just the slowest one. Um, and so that additional contribution of phi q or, or the two point functions changes the, uh, uh, the evolution of the system. And the way it changes it is that among other things, uh, it, uh, as you can see in this formula here, uh, right? One of the contribution to um, uh, one of the contributions to the uh, 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 to this um, uh, um, to this equation is the term proportional to the gradient of uh, velocity, or rather divergence of the velocity. If you are interested in bulk viscosity, that contribution is essentially produces the. Um, uh, the uh, the contribution to bulk viscosity, which um, uh, which changes, which depends on the frequency. So using using very rough uh, field theoretic terms, 
you can maybe say that um, the divergence of uh, transport coefficients is a result of integrating out a mode which is massless at the critical point. Yes, in the analogy, the analogy in the uh, in the language of quantum field theory will be exactly that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you integrate uh, out what you shouldn't integrate out, and mm -hmm. as a result, uh, your theory develops uh, um, non-locality in space and time. And that non-locality is, uh, uh, in, among other things, is reflected in the frequency dependence of coupling constant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, okay, I don't see any other from the audience, but I did have a question of my own. So um, it's kind of... A, a cool idea by itself that when you have uh, hydrodynamics that is strictly speaking only valid at uh, zero frequency and of course system is evolving you definitely need something to extend the validity to something developing so that picture is clear in terms of the heavy ion collisions however the system is relatively small and expanding very fast so uh, is there like a quantitative way of understanding how this may extend the validity to a certain degree that is sort of useful in heavy end collision. Will it, will it be really, um, well, helping much? It's a hard question to answer because it's, um, it depends on your definition useful. Um, well, <laughs> quantitatively, of course, I understand, let's say, the system is roughly, I don't know, 20 Fermi over C, so the energies, so frequencies that is sort of infrared are basically one over that, which is uh, what, 20 MeV, let's say, or 10 MeV, mm -hmm. right? So uh, going to anything less than that is basically hopeless. So you need to extend at least to that frequency or above, obviously. Uh, is there a chance that we sort of in the right ballpark of this game? Um, so, the short answer is uh, yes, there is a chance, uh, but uh, yes, in heavy ion collisions, of course, uh, the separation of scales, which is necessary in order for, for this, um, uh, for hydrodynamics to be uh, controllable uh, theory, uh, or controllable expansion uh, uh, is uh, very slim. So what would be in, um, for example, the number of particles is not astronomical. The ratio of the gradient, which is a scale, which is the typical homogeneity in the system, which is uh, of the order of five to 10 Fermi, uh, is, uh, barely an order of magnitude larger than the microscopic scale, which is, let's say, half a Fermi, right? Um, so to the extent that, um, uh, that, that this ratio of the microscopic scale, which we could take as a, uh, as a half a Fermi, and the scale which controls the homogeneity of the system, which is five to 10 Fermi, is about 10 or so, um, uh, this approach is useful. So moreover, uh, I, would, I would say that uh, it is actually more useful in a situation where you are close to the breakdown of hydrodynamics than when you are not, right? right, uh, right, right. I so see, I see you what, are, what if you are worried about uh, this, you should already worry about the applicability of, of hydrodynamics. And one thing which we also learned, which I think Jackie uh, emphasized in her earlier colloquium here is that hydrodynamics turns out to work, or maybe other speakers as well, um, uh, that hydrodynamics uh, uh, works even where we uh, didn't expect it to. Right. <laughs> well, but generically, when they say that, they actually do not mean that they approach the critical point. Yes, 
you are trying sort of in the in the sort of the most dangerous area. That's that's why it's yes. extra. Well, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we should realize that uh, approaching critical point is a dangerous area. It's dangerous to approach it with uh, bare uh, with um, um, with the with the usual hydrodynamics because it does break down. Right? Yeah, that that's probably so, the, the the actual I, the main point. Uh, so it is uh, it is what motivates this uh, this approach. So what we are trying to do is to um, delay this breakdown to see how far one could get um, uh, with the um, in a controllable way. Uh, as the hydrodynamics breaks down, you approach the critical point. Uh, what are the leading corrections? Uh, that uh, uh, that appear uh, and how to take them into account. Okay, okay, it's it's pretty fair. Um, any other questions? Emphasize which I did because it wasn't a part of point I was trying to make is that uh, uh, the other important uh, subject which attracts a lot of attention today is the other dynamics in very small systems. Right. Even. Uh, irrespective of uh, criticality. This is another example where uh, we are dealing with a regime close to uh, the regime where hydrodynamics breaks down. And uh, the question uh, which naturally arises is if you hydrodynamic hasn't yet broken down, but the deviation from it are no longer negligible, what are the leading, how does one describe the leading contribution to this, uh, uh, to the hydrodynamics beyond when it starts to break down? And I think the answer that we understand now is that uh, the leading contribution comes from fluctuations. And we now know how to um, describe that. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Let me see. There are no raised hands apparently. So at that, I think we will be wrapping this up. If there is anybody else who wants the last minute question, please do make sure you say that immediately because uh, we will close the questions. Thanks again for the presentation and thanks for making it accessible to everybody. I really uh, appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.